Hey everybody, this is Coach Hart with SystemBasketball.com. Um, today we are interviewing Zach King, Zach Keen from Macomb Lady Bombers basketball program. And we're going to talk system basketball here. This is our fourth episode of the System Zoomcast. Um, how are you doing today, Coach? I'm doing great. How about you? Um, with everything that's going on in the world, I really can't complain. I'm just happy to be here with you and get to share and talk a little about talk a little system hoops today. So um, let's dive in. And so how long have you been coaching high school basketball, Coach? Uh, this will be, I just finished up my 17th year as a head coach. Um, I had two years as an assistant uh, when I was going to college a little bit here and there, just helping out. Uh, but this is my 17th year. I just completed as a head coach. So uh, it's been it's been a pretty good pretty good ride so far. Okay. So so how many years at Macomb? I uh, just completed my seventh year at Macomb. Uh, we're getting ready to enter the eighth year there. Uh, I've coached at three different schools. Uh, I was at my first school uh, for just two years, and then I moved on to the second school, uh, and then that school ended up consolidating. Uh, but I've always lived here in Macomb, and I've kind of drove to my different jobs, and then it was just a little bit easier to be here in town and be closer to my family and things like that rather than mm -hmm. spending nights on the road and, and doing all those different things. Got it. So, so you've been coaching a long time, so I'm sure you've built up some mentors or people along the road that have impacted your coaching philosophy. Do you want to share who, who's had those, those impacts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as a, as a kid growing up kind of in the 80s and 90s, you know, you, you look to who everybody used to look to when you talk about motion basketball or you're talking about just traditional style basketball. But Bob Knight um, and Coach K come off right, right off the bat. But um, I've always kind of been when I when I played, it was a little bit different. Um, you know, I played for my dad, which is an experience that um, it's hard to explain for people that don't fully get it. It's not like you're playing for your parent at the time. Um, they're a lot harder on you than than anybody else just because they don't want to show favoritism or things like that. But um, I think you tend to, to coach the way you were coached a lot of times. And and um, and I kind of wanted to carry that on. So my dad was a big influence on me as well. You know, he was a head coach for over 30 years and, and did a lot of great things. And I just kind of want to carry that on. But um, more on the on the other side of the up and down side, you know, I've always been a coach that hasn't necessarily been quote unquote system basketball until the last few years, but I've always been a guy that believes in pressing and, and playing up tempo. So Rick Pitino um, has definitely been one uh, that was an influence. Nolan Richardson, you going back to the Arkansas days. 40 um, minutes to hell. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that's been a big influence. Billy Donovan uh, yeah. as well when he was at, his, at Florida uh, in, the, in his back-to-back -back years and winning mm -hmm. those championships. And then, of course, on, you know, on the offensive side, Paul Westhead, obviously. Yeah. Um, and, and just thinking outside the box, I think, more than anything. Not so much um, philosophy or things like that, but just a guy that's willing to take chances and, and not care what other people uh, were thinking about him or, or things along those lines. But, you know, I'm also a huge, avid reader. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, young enough where I didn't get to see uh, John Wooden coach, coach, per se. Mm -hmm. But reading all of his books and things like that, you know, I felt like a guy that I would like to model things after where he's not just after focusing on the wins and losses, you know, he's focusing on more important things along the way. Yeah. So it sounds like you grew up in the same area of high school growing up when back in the era where it was kind of prominent to play fast break basketball with the LMU, um, LSU, Oklahoma, but Billy Tubbs and Arkansas and then UNLV, Duke, um, Michigan, all those teams playing up tempo. Um, wish more teams would get back to it, but that's here nor there. Um, when when did you first learn about system basketball, coach? Uh, you know, I was a freshman in college. Uh, I attended Illinois College for two years. A freshman in college back in 1998. Um, never knew anything about the system um, except for coach comes in that day of practice and he says, well, we got Grinnell this week. And he basically, we tried to get in shape, a Grinnell shape in that time, which is impossible first and foremost. But I just remember it being um, some of the, the most fun that I'd had playing basketball where he's like, you know, this is going to be up and down and we're going to, and we, you know, we, we had a start team. And then as a freshman, you know, you're always on the scout team. So I got to play the Grinnell style. And I was just like, you know, this is amazing. Like, why, why would anybody not want to play this way? And, uh, just really got a taste of it there, but until you see it in person, you can't 
it's not something you can emulate, you know, if you're not really used to doing it. Uh, we tried the best you can as a, as a scout team, but until you see it firsthand, it, it's just unbelievable. What I, but that's when I got my first taste of it and just thought, you know, this is, this is the way basketball should be. You know, it's, it's not um, just roll the ball out by any means, but it was, it's definitely uh, controlled chaos, if you will. You know, there's, there's ins and outs to it and it, it's hard to get down, but uh, that was my first take of it. it was when I was a freshman in college at, at Illinois College. But uh, my first real getting to know about the system would have been in 2003. Uh, Coach Doug Porter and Coach Belf put on a clinic in Olivet. And uh, I remember I was, I actually was a, a speaker at my high school graduation. I went back and, and was a speaker that night uh, at the high school graduation. And my dad and I then got in a car and, and headed up to uh, all of that Nazarene, which was about a four and a half, five hour trip for us, uh, and sat there and listened to system basketball talk. And, you know, at the time, I was so intrigued with everything that was going on. I knew I wanted to play fast break as a head coach. I had just finished my first year as a head coach and thought, man, I really want to do something a little bit different. And um, it was just, it was an amazing experience listening to some of those guys talk and, and looking to where they're at now and how much the system has exploded. It was, it was kind of cool to be there, a part of the, one of those very first uh, run and gun clinics that they put on. Sure. So, you you said you're in you're going to be entering your eighth season, I believe, at your school. And what what did you run prior to your to your switch? So, were you a ball control, just, or did you play, or did you still get up and down, or how? I mean, what did you do prior to running system basketball? You know, I think I was one of those coaches before that you try to adjust to the kids that you have, and you still do that to an extent, but. Um, the two schools that I was at prior to Macomb uh, were, were two of the winningest programs all time in the state of Illinois on the girls' side of basketball. So, you know, tradition had kind of been set um, and they had kind of had their style that they went with. So kind of coming in to both of those, it was a little bit more, let's kind of stick with that style and not necessarily change a whole lot to, uh, you know, you don't, there's no sense in putting scratches on the car when it's running just fine. You know, you don't want to change a whole lot. So I was a little bit more ball control at the first school I was at. The second school um, at that time when I was there, they were the second winningest program all time in the state of Illinois. And they were a very up-tempo, run and jump, um, just push the tempo type ball. And, and we stuck with that. And I loved it. You know, I was like, this is, this is what I've been wanting to do. And I finally got uh, the kids to be able to do it. So we got up in people's shorts we were run and jump and we were if the threes open take it but we, we were taking any and everything we could but um coming here to macomb i tried to bring that system with me a little bit where we were just full out pressure um and, and i used to tell our kids when when i was at the school before when i first came to macomb you know our best offense is defense and i didn't mean it in terms of let's get stops but let's get steals let's turn people over and let's get going and um one of the last teams that i had before i came to macomb in, in all God's honesty, the best thing we could have possibly done is when we got the ball on offense was chuck it out of bounds at the far end to be able to put on a press just to get a turnover and, and get a layup out of it. We, we were not very good at running a half-court set. Uh, if we made more than three or four passes, we were going to turn the ball over. So we were all about let's pressure you, let's get a turnover, and let's see what we can get out of that turnover. So I tried to bring that with me to Macomb a little bit, and, and it's just a different um, – maybe a little bit different of an athlete and a different – type of setting our kids are um, not necessarily quote unquote basketball only type kids we're a larger school but uh, not that large we're we're like right at the small end of being a bigger school so we offer a lot of different things and our kids are pretty spread out trying to do a lot of different things which is just fantastic um, but at the previous schools I was at kids played other sports but basketball was their main driving force so here's a little bit different um, so some of the things that we were trying to do is a little bit more advanced I think than than what they were quite ready for, if you will. So, so why why did you decide to go to system basketball three years ago? I believe it's been three years that you've been running it. Is that correct? Yeah, we've run three. We're we're heading into our fourth year with it. You know, it's it's kind of a interesting story where I've always wanted to play the up tempo. Um, when we get in the summer, I'm a big advocate in the summer. Everybody plays in the summer. There's no reason that we should just be playing our top seven or eight in the summer. For me, everybody plays in the summer, and I'll sub them in system style, if you will, five in, five out, about every two or three minutes, just so every kid's getting to play. They're getting in different groups and things along those lines. And, and my assistant and I, um, you know, I kind of joked about it for a while, like, you know, we ought to just go system. Let's just, let's just get it and go and, and do different things like that. And then um, going on 
four years ago, right prior to this, I had a little bit of a health scare where I got a uh, blood infection. Um, was in and out of the, the hospital for quite a while. In fact, thought I was not going to make it to basketball season or much longer, actually. They, they told me that I could possibly have died from it. But um, sitting at home during that time, once I got out of the hospital and stuff, you know, it's kind of like it is right now with, with the whole COVID thing and the home quarantine is you get a lot of time to sit and think. Um, you know, and I'm, and I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, what can we do different? How can I make the program better? And, and you also start to think about if you get another chance to do something, you know, what would you go back and change? And I sat there and I thought, you know, why, why not give this a shot? Why, why wait and see if we want to do this and, and worry about what everybody else is trying to get you to do and that sort of stuff. So I said, you know, I'm going I'm to take this leap and we're going to do it. Uh, and I remember sitting down with my assistant coach and he, he kind of knew when I came in, I said, oh, look, I want to talk to you about how we've been playing. And he already goes, I'm on board. He, he kind of knew where we were headed and what direction we were headed. And, um, you know, so I think, I think it was just kind of that when you get a, when you get a scare and you get a chance to start over or do something different, um, you really don't care what other people are going to think about you or you really don't care about, um, what society tells you is success and things like that. It's just like, Hey, I want to do this. Let's go ahead and try it and let's see where it takes us. So you decided to make the move. Um, how'd you dive in? What resources did you tap into and who, what, what coaches did you seek advice from? Yeah, well, the first thing that I did um, was kind of go back to my old videos that I'd had when I went to that clinic, they put out, uh, I think it was like a four video set that I still had had um, and been watching it. I had, um, at the time, I had Running to Win, the original uh, Dave Arsenal book. I still have it. I mean, I've got all of those resources um, and been really kind of diving into it a little bit more. But um, one of the first things that I did was kind of reach out a little bit to like you've talked about we've been on the yahoo chat boards which is kind of where your whole um zoomcast webinars and all those get really got started uh so yeah. i i reached out just kind of got a board on that and kind of saw what was going on and, and kind of started picking some coaches brains but coach belf was one that really um gave me any information at all that we possibly needed or things like that you know a lot of times when when you're reaching out at the college level and coach arsenal is fantastic um, but a lot of times they're busy and inundated with all kinds of other things. So an assistant coach at those levels are a lot of times some of your best resources to be able to really get quote unquote time to sit down with them or get them to email you back in, in large quantities of a lot of information. And coach Belf was absolutely phenomenal. Um, when it came to that, you know, he was like an open book and wanted to share any and everything that he possibly could. And, um, you know, one of the things that he mentioned was getting the book, uh, that coach Porter and, and coach Smith had put out. So that was one absolutely there it is yep <laughs> the, the holy grail right there that's, that's that's the system bible right there you got ladies and gentlemen it yeah. absolutely is so <laughs> um so after talking to coach belf you know i ordered ordered the book off amazon had it primed to me so it was there in two days and i had plenty of time to sit and read it with with being at home but um i read it from cover to cover and it's just like you know these are these are things that i can get behind this i can i can see where this is going and i remember doing it when I was in college in terms of being on that scout team and getting to play a little bit that way and just thought, you know, this really makes sense now of, of how they're going to do it. So um, once I kind of got my ducks in a row that way, I, I thought, you know, this is, this is something that we can really sell to the kids. But before I do that, I've got to get some buy-in from my administration and I got to make sure um, I get some support and backing that way. Cause it can be a scary thing when you're stepping out on that ledge a little bit ready to make that jump and, and not sure that you've got people ready to support you. So um, I set up a meeting with my athletic director at the time, uh, came in and I said, look, um, this is what I'm wanting to do. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of wanting to go to this. And he was a basketball coach, uh, had lots of success back in his day when he was coaching. And um, the only thing that he ever said to me was, uh, he said, you know, let's say you get to Christmas and you haven't won a game what are you going to do? And I said, I'm, I'm going to stick with it. You know, if we start this, I'm, I'm going to see it through at least for the year. And he said, that's all I needed to hear is that you, you're going to stick with it. He goes, don't start something that you're not willing to finish out. And I thought, all right, if, a, if my athletic director's telling me this, then he believes in me and being able to do this and that sort of stuff. And he was, he was all on board. You know, he's like, I'm, I'm more of a traditional guy. He's like, but I love basketball. And he goes, I want, I want to see what we can do here and what, what you guys can do and where we can take it. And I was like, well, then, then let's do it. If you're going to support me, then, let, then let's do it. So that was, that was a, a great, you know, another resource for me in terms of we can talk basketball, but here's a guy that I knew had my back, um, 
no matter what happened, even if we hadn't won a game come Christmas time, he at least knew that we were going to finish out the season going this way. And that, that really put a lot of confidence in me to be able to stick with it and do it. It's all, all good stuff, coach. So I've asked this on all three of my system zoom casts so far. What is your definition of system basketball? If you had to define it, I mean, you it's know, just such a broad term. So absolutely. And, and, and I think, um, when you look at system basketball, we say system basketball, and everybody's got a different system. And I think everybody does what every coach does. We're the greatest thieves in the world. You know, we, we steal, beg, borrow, and do whatever we can from, from each other and make it our own. So I think, you know, when you look at the system, I think that's Grinnell has their own style, um, you know, and, and Coach Barber has his own style at Greenville, and, and Coach Smith had his at Redlands, and Coach Porter at ONU, and different things like that. So I think you, you put in some things with it, but everybody's kind of got their own little twist to it. To me, system basketball is, number one, controlled chaos. You know, it's kids flying everywhere. We use the word havoc quite a bit back from the VCU days. Yeah. Um, and, and just we want to create that as much as possible. Um, it's also ultimate participation. You know, no kid goes to practice saying, boy, I can't wait to sit the bench this week. Um, so it's a, it's a great participation thing for us. Um, it's also been a great tool for us to teach kids what it means to give 100%, what it means to work as a team, um, and what it means to sacrifice something of yourself for the greater good of everybody. You know, you're sacrificing minutes or maybe plays that are specifically set up for you or whatever it may be. It's, a, it's an ultimate sacrifice as well. And, you know, those are things that for me are going to go with kids for the rest of their lives, not necessarily basketball. You're not going to win, remember wins and losses forever, but you're going to remember lessons that you were taught through it. And, and system basketball teaches you those lessons. Okay. So I just find it ironic. And I mention this all, all, all the time, um, the book and everybody suggests things on my zoom clinics that you've been a part of and all this stuff that's been going on. It's great stuff. That's helping all of us learn and get through the times right now. But did you do the PowerPoint thing? Did you go to your AD to get the buy-in and stuff? Because I joke about it. Like no one would ever go to their AD or anyone or their parents and say, Hey, I'm going to go run the flex. Um, I, I just find it. Cause everybody believes this is so radical, so crazy. And so you gotta like make the special thing up. Did you, did you do that coach? Yeah. Well, the, the main reason that we really, that I did, um, I kind of sat the kids down and explained to them what we were doing is I started to see our numbers starting to dwindle. Like I said, we've got a lot of things that are offered, um, at our school, uh, our freshman and sophomore numbers had really started to drop. We were still in the process of trying to build up our junior high program to get more participants there to carry over into high school. And, and I really started to get worried and, and thinking, you know, if, if we don't do something here, we're going to have about six or seven kids to play varsity in the next couple of years. And, and we're not going to be able to do that. So we've got to figure out something to get numbers up and things along those lines. So I had a few kids that were like on the fence, like, I don't know if I want to play anymore. They played in junior high, but you know, they weren't sure about high school ball and that sort of stuff. So um, what I did was, is I, I did, I put, I put together, um, a, a presentation for the kids. But what really worked well for us is in the last uh, five years or so prior to running the system, we had a lot of kids that went on and played college ball at, at the smaller levels, but had a lot of success with it. So I went in and I found a few video clips of one of our better players that these kids still related to and can remember playing, um, playing against the system. And she was just ragged. You could see her after about the, the eight or ninth trip up and down the floor, she was just huffing and puffing. And I was like, you know, here was one of our best athletes that we had at the time was in great shape and, and look how she's playing and, and watch how the other kids are playing. And I think showing kids actual video uh, definitely helped where they, you know, if you, I think if you just come in and you talk about it, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to get buy-in with just talking about it. Kid, kids need to see things, you know, a lot of them are visual learners or they at least see it and say, wow, you know, that, that does look kind of fun, you know, and, oh, here's a whole nother group coming. Everybody gets to play, you know, everybody gets a chance. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? So um, I put together some highlight films, if you will, basically of, of what system basketball was, what it looked like um, and kind of talked to them about the style we would play and, and then started throwing out, here's what we're really looking to do and, and how many shots we want to take. And some of the kids are like, no, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to do that? And I said, you know, it'll come, it'll, it'll happen. And then um, I, the kids really, I wouldn't say quote unquote bought in at that point, but they were excited about it. You know, that's, it's something new, it's something different and they were willing to give it a try. And I think a lot of kids realizing that 
you know, I'm going to get an opportunity to play, not just I might play or I might sit the bench. Um, I think that really sparked some interest from a lot of our kids. But uh, after that, we had our first three practices, and then we always have a parent meeting. And at the parent meeting, um, I didn't really – I wasn't, quote, unquote, trying to sell it to the parents, more along the lines of saying, here's what we're going to do, um, just so you know, so, it, so that it's out there. Um, but not to sound rude or anything like that, but like any other coach, I'm, I'm not here for your suggestions by any means. You know, I, I'm not – somebody's not coming down at halftime saying, here's a few plays I'd like to run by you. You know, we're not definitely not doing that, but I did want the parents to know here, here's what it's going to look like, you know, and, and it, it's going to seem different and it's going to seem off the wall type stuff. And I think at that point it was about a 50 50 where half of the parents were like, this sounds amazing. I can't wait to watch it. And then you had your more um, traditional style parents. I think that um, on the traditional basketball side that were more, I think, um, a little judgmental right off the bat about, you know, what we're going to do and that sort of stuff. So, um, but I did give them a lot of information. I, I made a little bit of a packet for them to be able to see and kind of explain what it was. But again, it's, it's hard to sell it um, until you actually see it. So um, that's kind of where we went from there and trying to, trying to sell um, people on it. And then from that point, after we got playing just a little bit, it was really about more we wanted to sell it to the other kids at the high school. We wanted to sell it to the community and say, you know what, come watch this, come see, come see what we're doing and, and get a buzz going just to get some people into the gym. You know, this is it. Um, a lot of people, you know, want to talk to you when you're a coach and they're like, you know, you're co and then they find out you coach girls basketball and it's kind of like, Oh, and then they're kind of, <laughs> it's kind of the same way a lot with um, fans. A lot of times when it comes to high school girls basketball, you know, they're all, I don't want to go watch girls basketball. It's slow or it's not entertaining or it's, I'm like, we're going to try to put up a hundred points every single night. We're going to, and you know, yeah. so kids were like, all right, well, I'll come and watch if you're going to do that. And it kind of really built a buzz that way. So it was all about just trying to be a used car salesman basically and sell it as yeah. best you can. I believe um, coach Porter, on one of the zoom, zoom calls said, um, you got to kind of like brainwash the system in them. So, um, and, and constantly do that. So, um, before we dive into the normal questions that everybody likes to get answered by, I think it's just, I think it's system lingo. If you want to know this, that, that this, that, of, of what you do with system. Um, what's the most points you guys have put up, Coach? The most points that we put up was 100. Um, we did that. Uh, in fact, we did it in the very first year that we were running it. And uh, previously, the highest point total um, in our program history was 78. Um, and in about the fifth or sixth game of the year we surpassed that and you know at that point the kids were like boy we can we might be able to do this you know and really get going and, and I think the key though and, and I heard uh, I can't remember which one of the coaches was on one of your one of your pro, uh, programs before if you get another team to run with you that's your best opportunity to score the most points you know yeah. you can't you can't do it if a team is trying to slow down a little bit so we had a team in our conference that was up tempo not quite like we were but it turned into a track meet basically and one of the, was um, just one of those games where everything was dropping for both teams and it was one of the most exciting games to be a part of but um, we hit that hundred mark and our, our kids were just like oh man this is this is so cool and um, when you get another team to run with you that makes it a lot more fun in fact that game ended up being the seventh highest combined score in Illinois girls history so um, it was it was a pretty fun night uh, but we haven't gone over the hundred mark yet we're, we're still trying mm -hmm. to get to that but but the hundred mark so far has been our our key point if we could get to the 200 point like Greenville that would be amazing but uh that's that's definitely going to take a uh, probably another eight minutes on the clock and and some special players maybe maybe five overtime game or something absolutely <laughs> uh, what's the most threes you guys hit in the game the most threes that we've hit in the game has been 16 um we have taken as many as um close to 50 in a game um but the most we've ever made is 16. I think our, our season record holder just made the season record again this year. And she has eight as an individual. Um, but as a team, it's been, it's been 16, but um, we kind of do a, a crazy thing where um, again, I wanted buy-in from the community. So I went out, uh, we have a McAllister's deli. I don't know if anybody's familiar with McAllister's deli, but it's a, uh, a, a chain nationwide chain. that's kind of uh, famous for their sweet tea. So uh -huh. basically, what I did was I went out to McAllister's Deli and I, I kind of pitched them the idea of, of jumping on board and being a teammate with us that, you know, if, if we can hit 10 threes, would you be willing to give away free tea to our student section? 
and they were like, well, how, how are you going to do this? You know? And so we came up with, well, every time we hit a three, we'll put a letter up and we're going to spell out McAllister's. And every time we hit a three, we'll advertise it as a McAllister's three point basket and that sort of stuff. And they said, all right, that sounds fantastic. But if we're going to do it this way, why not just give tea to everybody that's there? And I said, if you're willing to do that, let's, let's do it. So, wow. um, people in our community actually started showing up in Grove just to get free tea. You know, it was crazy just to get the free tea. Uh, if we hit 10 and, and the kids were even into it, you know, we're come in timeouts. They'd be like, Hey, we're, we're at eight. We need two more. You better start gunning for it. You know, we want free tea and stuff. So, um, that was definitely a, a fun thing to do with our kids and, and McAllister's loved it as well. You know, I get some people in the door to get free tea and then they also are spending money the other way. So, yeah. so I think it's so, a system team and you can sell it to somebody in your area that's willing to, to jump on board with you for some type of promotional thing. That's, that's the coolest thing yeah. you can do. I think when you do your, I think when you do your thing and you got teas for threes or something. We did. Yep. Teas for yeah. threes is what is absolutely what we called it. You so is it basically after the games were over, people headed to the McAllister's or what? Yeah, well, they got a, uh, I basically told them I would take care of, or if you want to give away free tea, I'll take care of everything. So I just had um, some cards made, like yeah. a little business card type thing. We put a stamp on the back. I showed them exactly at McAllister's what it was going to look like. So they knew that sort of stuff. And then um, at the end of the game, our JV kids are basically in charge of handing out um, a card to every single person that was in attendance before they leave. So, love it. Um, but yeah, the kids absolutely Love it. It's good for uh, the entire year. I think it was from, it, they're good from November till the end of March. So they could use them at any point in time. It didn't have to be right away. So you had kids that were saving them up like, oh, I got five or six of them. I can't wait to go take my friends to get free tea or whatever it may be. Wow. So any other impressive stats? Um, like have, you have you gotten, have you set any records on steals or offensive rebounds or, all, or anything we, uh, that you can think of? We... Uh, the first year we were running it, you know, we, we've always been a team that presses and a team that wants to force turnovers. But the first year with really picking things up, we were able to force over a thousand turnovers, which um, is, a, is a lot. You know, we're really up tempo and, and pushing it. Um, but we were we were setting, um, I think every record, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I think every record that you could possibly think of in terms of um, whatever you may keep for statistics, we broke it in that first year, which was really uh, a cool thing. And, and that's really kind of what this came about. You know, let's, let's give these kids things that they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. You know, I, I remember back when I was in high school, I couldn't tell you how many games we won total when I was in high school. Um, but I can tell you certain things that happened in games or, or things that kind of stood out that you remember, you know, like, oh, the gym was packed when we played at this place or that place. Well, our kids are able to say, when we go on the road, people are coming to the road to see us play. You know, you're going to other teams' gyms, but there's people there to see you play just because of your style. Or, um, you know, our kids are going to get together 10, 15 years down the road at a high school reunion and be like, remember that time when we set the, the school record in scoring? Or um, remember when so-and-so hit a three-pointer and she'd never even taken one before in her life and she hit two of them in a game and things along those lines. I think those are things that the kids are going to take with them forever that's really going to last more than the wins and the losses. That's great, Coach. Are you – are you the only team in your state that runs it? No, there are there are a couple other teams. Um, I know there's a team up near uh, the suburb of Chicago that runs it a little bit. That we uh, we've been trying to get summer games, but of course, with the way things worked out this year, there's no summer participation stuff going on. But um, they're a little bit far of a drive both ways for us, even to meet halfway to be able to play and that sort of stuff. But um, there have been a couple teams in our area that have done it for a year or so and then kind of went by the wayside um, and went away from it. And I think a lot of the reason is they started to bring in really good players that they wanted to just kind of put their offense around those good players and not have to take them off uh, the floor as much as possible. But there are a few people hit or miss here and there that have kind of done similar things, but I wouldn't say necessarily are all in like we are. Okay. Um, what, are your, what are your system goals, Coach, for your team? Yeah. So, you know, in the, in the regular system, when I say regular system, like the college level, they're looking to get 100 shots. You know, we kind of have made that a little bit more um, easily reachable or, or adjusted, I guess, for high school with only 32 minutes. So we're trying to get 72 shots off in a game, uh, 36 of those to be threes. We're still trying to get the 30% offensive rebounds. We want a plus 20. Uh, actually, we started out at plus 15 and then bumped it up to a 20, but we kind of want a plus 15, plus 20 in terms of shot differential. Um, and then we wanted 26 turnovers a game. And after about the first 
two or three weeks, we bumped up our turnovers to 32. Wow. Um, the 26 was, we were getting that pretty easy and we just wanted to kind of challenge the kids, but um, we were able to reach those quite a bit. And anytime that we were able to get all of those in, we won every single ball game. Well, that was going to be my next, that was, that was going to be my next question. If you've ever lost when you hit all five system goals. So. Yeah, no, we, we haven't. When we had all the system goals, we win every game. The, the games that we're, getting beat where you see the biggest difference is when we're not getting offensive rebounds. Um, and when you're not getting offensive rebounds, that definitely plays a role in the total of shots that you're getting off. Um, so if you're not forcing more turnovers, you got to find a way to get your shots more um, in one way. And the only way to get more shots is either offensive rebound or forced turnovers. So if you're not getting those offensive rebounds, that's, that definitely is going to cost you games. Would, would you know offhand how many times you've hit all five in the last three years? I don't off the top of my head. I, I, I couldn't tell you. But, I mean, like I said, when, when, you're, when you're borderline close, the, the biggest statistics for us to look at in terms of wins when it comes to when you're looking at all the statistics is definitely the offensive rebounds. That plays a huge role um, in all of it. And then, obviously, if you're making shots, um, we're not great shooters by any means. Not great shooters. I think, and, you know, from, from the three-point line, we're shooting somewhere in the neighborhood of like 24, maybe 25%. And that would be doing really, really well for us. So in order for us to make up for that, we've got to get more shots off um, just to get up for those points. So in order for that to happen, it's got to be either force a turnover or get the offensive rebounds. But um, if you're looking at, at the biggest keys for this and, and what it's done, at least from our standpoint, it's the offensive rebounds and then trying to keep that tempo or that pace best you can. So... We talked about the goals. What do you feel is the hardest one out of those five for you to actually achieve in a game? Is you know, I think, yeah, for us, for us, I think the hardest thing to really do is, again, is the offensive rebounds. We're not a great offensive rebounding team um, for whatever reason. I don't know if it's, if it's a, a, a girls basketball thing or what it is, but, you know, we really got to fight for a lot of those rebounds and, and, um, find ways to be aggressive on the boards. We do a really good job of being aggressive uh, on the defensive end as far as going for steals, uh, but we don't do as a, a good of job of being aggressive as going for the offensive boards. We'll, we'll work on it in practice. It's one of those things where a lot of times you do things in practice and you go to the game and it's like, did we even practice this week or did we even do some of these things? But um, one of the big downfalls for us, obviously, is offensive rebounding. That's, that's one of the harder things for us to do. And then in terms of that, if you're not offensive rebounding, getting up that total number of shots, especially if you're playing teams that want to slow it down against you or want to kind of spread it out. We don't have a shot clock, so that definitely plays a role in it. You know, we have a few teams in our conference that will try to spread it out and go the old North Carolina four corner um, and just work it as long as they can, or they'll run the flex um, and make 20, 25 passes if they can and just try to milk the clock as much as possible. So if you don't have a team that um, is willing to run with you and, and you're having a hard time, getting rebounds for second chance opportunities, it makes it tough. And then if you get a team that handles the ball extremely well and is very, very disciplined, that makes it, that makes it pretty tough as well. But a lot of times in high school, you're always going to find a, a team that has one or two kids that you can leave open, that you encourage to shoot, that will keep shooting until coach takes them out. Um, what, what offensive system do you do? You, you, you hit on it that everybody kind of does a little bit of different things. Um, what, did, what did you decide on? Or has it evolved over the last three years to different things? Yeah, ours is, ours is a little bit more of a, of a hybrid, I guess, if you will. We, we employ the uh, Loyola Marymount break. You know, we're a numbered break system team. Uh, we have a rim runner. Uh, the biggest difference, I think, for us is most teams are going to put their best player running the right side or the two spot. Mm -hmm. We put our best shooter on the left side running the three spot. And the main reason we do that is, is a lot of times everybody runs their offense to the right side. Um, so you see the right side is constantly being defended, being defended, you know, or people are sideline break people, you know, watch the sideline break, sideline break. Well, that's great. We're coming across half court. We're going to look opposite um, and get a lot more shots off that way. So our better shooter we put on the left-hand side just as almost a, um, a ploy because you think our better shooters on the right side because that's what everybody else does. You know, we're already outside the box. Why not be outside the box a little bit more? Um, but once we get into a half court set, we don't have a quote unquote set offense that we really, really want to run, but we have options for the kids. We run a, a five out um, where our trailer that would normally come down can either set a drag screen. She can play at the top. She's a, we, the first year we ran, our best player actually was our trailer. We had her take the ball out of bounds. She came down. She used to be a post player. 
that we found out real quick, she was pretty good from the three point line. So that definitely helped, you know, when we would have played a different style of system, we never would have known that she could have hit threes like this. Uh, that she did, but it worked out really well because a lot of teams will sit back and their post defense will wait in the lane and wait for you to come down to your spot. So uh, our, our one or two would penetrate in and just turn around a little flip trail kick to our to our five. Uh, she'd knock down a shot right there, but we're really a more of a five out um, pass screen away. And we kind of run what's called a circle motion where the opposite side of the ball, the first cutter is going to circle through the lane. And then the second cutter is coming up to the top of the key for a three point shot. And our screener will pop out to the wing. So you're either getting a layup, a three at the top or three at the wing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have it, we reverse it to the other side. And we're looking for the same look the other way, but normally we will get a shot off in the first uh, two or three passes going one way. Rarely do we have to work it back the other direction unless it's a dead ball situation a lot of times where the defense is already set. Did you get that from Russ Pinnell? Yeah, we did. We got that from Russ Pinnell. Um, he was at Central Arkansas, uh, was a great guy I'm willing to share. I've, I've kind of ran five out things before, but I ran it differently, more of a methodical. Um, Bobby continue. Huggins, like Huggins that, type? Yeah, oh. it, was, it was the Bob Huggins type, and then we kind of put some different things to it where – um, we set a flex screen on the backside and bring a kid over to flash and then she would pop out and just do some different things that way. But again, it was a little bit more of a slow down type stuff. So I was researching, you know, we got, there's gotta be some different five out mm -hmm. options. Most five outs that you're looking for, if you go to YouTube or anywhere you go to is just the simple, you pass, you cut through and everybody fills up when, you know, yeah. for me that, that wasn't going to work. That's easy to defend eventually. So Right. We had to come up with something, and I just like, you know, we would cut a kid through, but I never thought about circling them all the way back through. So I was doing a little research, and I came across uh, some of his stuff. So I reached out to him, and he, he was phenomenal about um, sending me any and everything that I needed to, to get going with it. But we just kind of put in some options for the kids. We don't have any hard, fast rules. We just kind of say, you know, these are your options, and if somebody comes sets a screen, you curl. If they ball screen, then we we're going to do this, or they kind of fill, and then – um, we also will run the four out one in dribble drive motion a little bit with the same kind of concepts that we have with our five out and the same kind of concepts with the dribble drive motion. Um, the, the kind of crazy thing with us, I'm all about ownership, ownership in our program and things like that. So when we send a new shift, those kids decide what they want to run. They, yeah. they know, um, hey, we've got a kid that's not a three point shooter. That's not a great ball handler around the perimeter. We're going four out one in and that girl's going to be the one in and just keep going opposite the ball. Um, if we go a shift and the kids are like, we're all three point shooters, we're going five out for sure. And, and we'll run it that way. But I let them choose the offense. I let them choose the defense. As long as they know what they're doing when they go on the floor, I'm all about ownership and letting them own it. That way they, they, you know, there's no excuse to not knowing what's going on or why didn't you know what you were doing? You, know, you guys decided what you wanted to play. And it also makes them communicate quite a bit before they go in as well, knowing who's in what positions and who's covering what spot. And it's great to see them communicate. Would you consider yourself a system defense purist, the on, off, stay, or do you kind of hybrid it and do your own, own thing? Yeah, we kind of hybrid a little bit. Um, we, do, we do the on press, um, but then we'll also jump into, we call it double fist, but it's the Wahlberg press, the yep. Wahlberg run and jump. Yep. Um, then our off press actually is more of a three-quarter court, like one through one, where we'll look to trap just to get you to throw some long lag passes over the top. Because on the girls' side, it's hard to make some of those long diagonal passes. Um, so we're able to get away and cheat a little bit more with it. But um, again, on the defensive side, when we have when we have a group go in, they're deciding what they're in. And, and okay. it was really interesting to see, especially the first year, we had uh, one group that had a little bit longer athletic kids. And mm -hmm. the second group was little mice. So the one group would go in and they're like, we're in on, we're all over the ball, we're going to smother you, whatever it may be. And then 35 seconds later, here comes a group and now they're in run and jump um, with a two guard front and teams are seeing a completely different defense, possibly even a completely different offense mm -hmm. in a 35, 40 second change. And it's hard for high school kids to adjust to that on the sideline. And it's hard for, a lot of times even for coaches to recognize different right. things, give instructions. I like it coach. You're, you're stealing practice time away from your opponent by throwing out various looks and they may not even get a beat on what you're doing because you're letting your kids have ownership. Like you said, it's kind of, that's some good stuff. I'm going to make sure that, steal some of that next year. So, um, so you're in year four. I mean, you, you think back to year one when you were first doing this, what was the hardest part do you feel when you were first starting to install it? I think, you know, the hardest part for me was getting the kids to believe that this was going to work. 
Um, I think we had some reservation with it. We had a girl coming back who was our best player. Uh, we had a lot of solid seniors. I think we had six or seven seniors that first year. So they had been um, the year prior to doing this. We were like, we'd just gotten bumped up to a 3A, uh, which in our classification is schools that are about uh, anywhere from 550 to about 1550. So, I mean, there's a pretty good jump right there. And we're about the 570 mark. So we're at the bottom end um, in terms of, of size. Five out of the last six years, the state champion has come out of either our regional or sectional. And yeah. we just we didn't have the horses to compete with that sort of stuff. So we were like, you know, what can we do to keep the game close? What can we do to, to do different things? So we were a swing offense team the year before. And it was all about finding one kid, take care of the ball, let's slow it down type stuff. And it it about killed me. You know, I, I, I yeah. hated it. I couldn't stand it, but it was the only thing we could do to try to keep things close with playing a big jump in, in class size, if you will. So we went to this, um, the number one score that we had coming back. Um, I was like, look, you're going to get your shots. You're going to get this, you're going to get that. And I think you had some kids that were really excited about getting more shots. And then you had the kids that were like, boy, I'm, I'm losing some opportunities here. I'm not quite sure how this is going to work. Uh, first two games in, I just like every other system coach you've probably ever heard. I looked at my assistant and thought, what the hell are we doing? You know, we, <laughs> this is, uh, I know we're going to stick with it, but I, but I just, I don't know. I don't know. You know, and you're already starting to hear the grumblings from across the, the, the best part about our gym is we've only got bleachers on one side. If you could get that taken care of in your gym, that's the greatest thing ever. Yeah, uh, on the other side, but um, I, the back I, hey, I have, I have it on both sides. Unfortunately. Yeah. The one side is, is the absolute best because uh, you don't have to listen to it, but you can kind of see the faces and see things like that. And I think the hard part was is when we were giving up layups, some of those traditional basketball people were like, you know, we're giving up layups, you're doing, and then not really realizing what we were doing. Finally, a third game into it, we host our own tournament at the beginning of the year, which is a pretty solid tournament. And we were playing a team that uh, have not beat – since I had been there. Um, it was a team that we had regularly beat at my old schools that was a, a pretty much a perennial powerhouse. Coming to this school, we had a different mentality. You know, they would just kind of roll over and die. They came out at halftime, we were down 10, 12 again. And I keep telling the kids, this is where we want to be. This is where we want to be. We came out and uh, not to be too graphic, but there was a girl that was dry heaving in the corner into a trash can. And I was like, just look over there, we got them. We got them. And now the kids all of a sudden are like, we're not tired at all. How could they be, you know? And we went on a huge run in the second half, ended up beating them. And I think from that point, game three, the kids were just like, we can do this. This is going to work type stuff. And then from there, the kids really started to buy in. And I think when you get the kids to buy in and excited about it, that transforms over to the, over to the parents as well. So let's, let's get into some of the stuff that everybody, I mean, I don't know why it always comes up with system, but it's, what's the biggest criticism in your eyes of, of system basketball that you're, you're constantly dealing with? with parents or players that are questioning, questioning it? Like, I think I, one of the things that I hear the most is it's circus basketball. We're going, we're going to these places and people are coming to see a circus or a freak show because it's not basketball, you know? And I've had conversations with parents um, about different things, you know, and, I, and I'm sure I come across as being rude, but I'm like, you know, who are you or who am I to say what is basketball and what isn't basketball? You know, who is the foremost authority on you have to play this way? Just because, yeah. uh, just because you don't see Division I colleges subbing five people in and five people out, you, we're not allowed to do it. You know, it's, um, it, it, it's absolutely crazy. And, and in fact, this last year, um, we were extremely young, really, really young, um, with not a lot of experience. We still wanted to get kids in. We're still playing a, a, a tough schedule. So it made it really tough at times. There was some really long stretches where it was tough. And, and I think when you're a system coach, you've got to have thick skin, number one. Um, mm -hmm. If you're going to be outside that box, you've got to be uh, willing to take some chances. Um, you know, I think if, you, if you've ever seen the movie Moneyball, yeah. uh, at the very end of the movie, you know, they say the first guy through the wall is the one that takes a lot of the hits and, and gets the bloodiest. So I think you've got to be willing to bust through that wall and be ready to take those opportunities and those chances. Um, but it kind of as the grumblings were going on a little bit this year, I, I tried an own little personal experiment, if you will. Um, we changed absolutely nothing except I would send three or four kids to the table rather than five um, occasionally. And I would hear things like, finally, we're doing things right. And we should be, you know, 
nothing else changed other than the subbing situation. And all of a sudden people looked at it like it was a whole different, different type of game type stuff. But, um, you know, I think that's the biggest thing is that people see the five in five out and the short shifts and don't really understand what it's about and why you're going in such short shifts and what it means to give a hundred percent and go all out. Cause kids will pace themselves. You know, I, I, when I was a player, I would pace myself thinking, boy, I want to play as long as I can. I don't want to come out. Um, so until you get them to learn what it means to go a hundred percent full speed, kids will continue to pace themselves and it will look like, you know, why do they need to come out? They're not going very hard or they're not whatever it may be. But I think that's the biggest criticism that we kind of see is the five and five out. And they think it just is, turns into not traditional basketball. Well, you, you, you touched on your shifts. Um, when do you send, when do you send your next five to the, t to the table? Yeah, we, we go about anywhere between 35, and 45 seconds. Um, we have a, a shift chart. Uh, I think the first shift comes in at the 720 mark or head to the table close thereof. Um, my assistants are in charge of all of that. They, I mean, I have a, I have a chart myself, but um, I have two assistants. My uh, head assistant basically takes care of all of my subbing. He has the chart. He's getting the kids ready for the next group. Um, and then we have a, a sitting order on our bench. The next five sit between myself uh, and my assistant coach who puts the next five in just to make sure we've got the five. Um, he lets them know when it's time for them to go. My other assistant sits at the end um, and he will try to talk about to the group that come, just came off the floor. I'm a little bit different. I know Coach Arsenal sits at the end and just kind of watches. Um, I've definitely been a, it's hard for me to let go of those reins yep. quite a bit, <laughs> but I've found a way to kind of do it. I, I, so basically what I've done is, is I've decided I'm going to sit in the middle. Um, I'm coaching the kids that are getting ready to go in. Hey, do you know what defense you're running? And I kind of give them some point, you know, I'm seeing this a little bit. Have you guys seen this? You know, this girl doesn't like to go to her left. Maybe we should, maybe you guys should think about double fist and instead of you're going, uh, you're off this time or on this time, or whatever. And they'll, they'll talk it out. And it just kind of, I just want to put some ideas in their head, but not tell them you have to do it this way. Um, the other thing I'll do is then as the kids come off as my assistant, talk to the group that just came off and give them some feedback. Um, he's keeping stats. So what he's looking for in our shift charts, um, we're keeping track of the only, the only stats we keep track of during the game is total shots, three point shots, offensive rebounds and turnovers forced. So we're all about, you're trying to get each, each shift is trying to get two, but probably more like three shots a shift. Um, so he, as they come out, he's telling them where they're at. Look, you got two offensive rebounds and you got no turnovers. So you only got off two shots. You know, you didn't get this. So trying to give them feedback that way. And then when they come and sit down next to me, they're on my left side and, I'll, and I'm giving them a little bit of feedback, you know, Hey, look to shoot the gap a little bit more, look to do this. And then I just try to coach the five that are on the floor. Whoever coach puts out there, and that's just I'm I'm going to take care of it uh, with the ones that are on the floor, and he takes care of all the subbing. Where it starts to become difficult, the first half we don't worry about fouls, just like Grinnell would be. You know, unless you get four, then you're going then you're coming out. If you get three, um, we're we're letting you know, hey, you're going to start losing some shifts here unless you you know stop fouling. And it's amazing, kids will stop fouling. You know, when they got three and you're letting play, they will stop fouling. But um, when it gets into the second half, it starts to get hard a little bit because you want to save some of those better players in case you're in a situation where you need them at the end. So now coaches scratching and, and moving kids and shifting kids around and they're out of their shifts and out of them. And it starts to be a, a little bit more of a headache for him. Um, and I'm just like, just make sure you got the spots filled, you know, and I'm trying to keep up on my chart sometimes. And I'm like, where are you even at on your, well, I had to shift this kid here and move this kid there. And um, but he's, he's great about getting the shifts organized and that sort of stuff. And, and everybody kind of has their own job, just like they do when you go out on the floor. So, I, so correct me if I'm wrong. So you have two assistants on the bench taking care of all that, or do you have more? I do. Nope. We have two. I have a freshman coach, which is basically, um, my head assistant coach at the varsity level. And then I have a JV coach who's our phrase off coach. So my, the guy that's been with me the longest is the guy that's taking care of the shifts going in and out. Um, the, the guy that we just got in the last couple of years, we kind of have a turnover at our JV level quite a bit. Uh, I like to use a lot of our junior high coaches to come up best they can. Um, but we've had turnover to junior high level. We're finally starting to build that where we get the same guy. So he's now been with me. This is going to be his third year coming in. Yeah. Um, he's basically in charge of your sending kids in after that. The first year we ran it, it was just me and my one assistant. Um, and it was, we, we tried 
Uh, I reached out to Coach Porter. He's like, here's my sub form and how we do it, the plus minus and all that. And I thought, all right, this is easy. We can do this. It ended up being way more work. And I'm like, I don't know how anybody keeps this at all. We scratched it halftime. Coach is like, I can't keep the plus minus. I can't keep the shifts. I can't. So we, we kind of made our own. And I was like, let's just keep it as simple as possible. But um, at that point, after we made our own, I could keep track of the stats. That, that was easy for me. Okay, there's a shot. Check mark. That was a three. Check that one. You know, I could, I could definitely do that. But now that we've gotten another assistant on board with us, uh, it really kind of frees me up a little bit more to do a little bit more talking and, and coaching to the kids a little bit and communicating with them. Are they using a stopwatch to determine 35 seconds or what are they doing on the bench? We're, doing, we're, we're watching the clock as it runs because, um, you know, some, sometimes you might go 35 seconds, but there's only been 10 seconds of actual play time. So we're, we're going based on the clock. Uh, the clock, the clock. Okay. Yep. Um, what we will do, though, is if there's a dead ball and we're within a five-second time frame, seven-second time frame, we may send a shift, go ahead and go. And one team may have just got back. There's been times where one shift has gone really long, uh, and then the next shift, just to get us back on, quote, unquote, schedule and where we're at, we may have a team that's in there for 10 seconds, and another team goes back in, another shift goes back in, just to get us back on our um, normal rotation. Otherwise, my assistant's got to start doing math, and that's not a good thing. <laughs> So you have a stud in your program. Do you ever do you believe in double shifting, or have you have you done it? The only time that we double shifted when we had the the one kid that was really good is when we get to the near um, kind of an end of a game situation. Uh, but what I would do for for her on that was I would try to sit her two if I could um, at about the four minute mark, and so well, I'd kind of sit her out. And then if we're anywhere close to the two minute mark, she wasn't coming off the floor if it was a close game. Uh, I think that's one thing you hear about as far as system basketball goes. The majority of the time, you're either seeing a blowout at one end or the other. You know, it's, it's, it's rarely is it a close game. I mean, we've had a few here and there that have been close games, but it, it's, it's going to be one extreme or the other most of the time. But um, it has come up a few times. But again, if, it, if, that, if we see that starting to be the case with about four minutes, I'll try to rest her a couple minutes. Um, and then if she's going to go back to back, I'll try to play her that way. And then I'll try to surround her with, making a, a, a group of four, I guess, then with our next best five or six kids so we can kind of keep them fresh, if we will. Okay, so are you a two-group uh, coach or are you a three groups of five? How, how do you determine your shifts? It kind of depends and varies a little bit from year to year. Um, the first year we did it, uh, I tried to – we had – I think there was 13 kids or 14 kids somewhere in there. Uh, at our varsity level, and I try to make it where every kid got the exact same equal amount of shifts in the first half, so that every kid said that they played so many shifts. So I would I would send um, they for the most part they were kind of in two groups, if you will, but it was almost like we had three by the time you start putting kids in there. But every kid would get the equal amount of shifts in the first half. The second half, then I would make sure that every kid got at least two shifts, three if possible. But then by the fourth quarter, we cut it down to where we just had our best 10, maybe 11 kids that were, were getting in and out, but they would be the best 10. So we would cut down to two groups um, and then go, go from there. But um, if I had kids that were a little bit on the lower end, a lot of times I'd put them in the same group and sub them in and out for each other. Like they would just rotate for one another. So if there was kid 14 and 13, uh, a lot of times I put them in the same group one time 13 would be in and then the next shift 14 would be in and then maybe they neither one would be in the next time. Yeah. So as you know, I'm, I'm moving to it for the first time full time this season. And I think I have a pretty good grasp of the X's and O's and the defensive philosophy of it. But the, the end game coaching, I think until you coach in it, you're going to struggle with it. So how long did it take you to get used to the, doing the shifts and the, I mean, it's, and constructing them. Do you do a, we hear on the calls, a five, a five, five shift chart or a seven shift chart. What do you usually employ? Three shift chart? I mean, I've heard it. I mean, obviously the more shifts you have, the less minutes each player gets. Right. So what I, what I tried to do was, uh, and what I still continue to try to do is I try to look at it as if, if we're going into practice, um, and you let kids choose their, their teams, they always go with the same kids. 
when I'm, when I'm in practice a lot of times and I want it to be competitive, I try to divide them up best I can to be competitive. So I do the same thing when it came to, to game shifts where I'm like, okay, I've got a point guard and a backup point guard. So one's going to be in one group, one's going to be in the other. Um, and then I try to look, you know, like if, if they were going against like strengths and weaknesses, I guess a little bit, you know, if I wanted this group to be uh, a little bit slower, but they're going to be long and athletic. Whereas this group's going to come in they're, they're, they're small, but they're not going to have a post, but it doesn't matter because they're going to run five out or whatever it may be. I tried to balance them best that I could. Um, but I also tried to look at each other's strengths. You know, if I had a, a girl um, that was our stud that could shoot from the outside and could post up and could do a bunch of different stuff. And then I also had another guard that was great about getting to the basket and just scoring me personally, I wouldn't put them in the same group. The only reason being is, is I want the first one to be a distributor and get it to our stud. And I want our second girl to create for other people a little bit, but still try to get to the rack best they can. Um, so I would try to divide them up best I could as far as that goes. Um, and then I'd let them be in those groups in practice that I could, you know, the first couple of weeks we're in practice, I'm, I'm kind of seeing who fits well together. And you kind of know in the back of your mind, mm -hmm. who's going where and what. Um, but then the other thing that I try to do in practice is, is I try to sell them on their group and that's your group. Take ownership in your group. Like you don't want to lose anything we're doing. It's your group versus their group or um, give your own group its own identity. Um, and that's something that our kids really bought into we already have the identity that, hey, this team is going to run, they're going to shoot, they're going to sub, it's crazy, it's chaos, you got to go see it. But then I wanted an identity within each group. So the group that uh, was our small little kids, they were all about the Wahlberg press, the double fists. And they're like, you know, we're going to come in and we're going to run and jump you. We're going to be like gnats. We're going to be all, and they would take pride in that sort of stuff. And the second group comes in and would say, you know what, nobody's throwing any passes over the top or they're not. So we would do different things like that. Um, I would encourage them, you know, hey, what's your group name this week, you know, and let them come up with a name and, we, and just <laughs> silly little things like that, that, that you think kids aren't into that they're at, they buy into and they, they really want to, to present that sort of stuff. But having an identity within their identity made it a little bit easier for me to sell the different shifts. And then they'd never wanted to be, there would be times where I'd say, do you want me to switch up the, your, your teams, switch up your shifts? You know, like, all right, the game's over tomorrow night. You me switch and don't switch them. Don't, and I'm thinking, okay, if you don't want me to switch them, I thought maybe we could, no, 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 we like what we're, so again, it's that, it's that ownership, I think, a lot of times, and then that, they get comfortable with playing with certain kids, kids that they may, never, may, may have never played with before, realize, hey, this, is, this kid will play hard for me and do the things that I don't want to do, but they'll do them, and so um, it, it's interesting to see the groups kind of form and, and build that bond and relationship within those groups. So the, the shift chart, is it constructed from start of the game to finish, or do you like have it to a certain point and then you, you maybe just freelance it and play field so I, based upon how, how kids are performed? Right. So I have it set for an entire game. Um, okay. First, I have it broken down even by quarters. Okay. Uh, so what I do is they'll, they'll rotate every other, um, and usually we're in a two-group rotation most of the time. Uh, and then so the second half rolls around, what I do is I flip flop them and the team that started the game comes off the bench second and my other group will start the second half just to kind of mix it up a little bit um, for them. And then the last two minutes is basically where we kind of go with who's playing the best and who's doing different things for us where we just kind of play yeah. depending on the situation. That'd be considered your finishing group? Absolutely. Now there's other times where if we're in a blowout, um, I'll do five in, five out next five up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of times you'll see, like, for instance, um, Coach Porter will talk about, you know, he's got a group where he gets his bottom kids in a little bit more when it's a blowout. And I think that's great. That's phenomenal. But in the same sense, I'm almost, I'm probably giving my kids more shifts than he is to start with. So what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll employ the next up is what we just call it. So that means the next five that get to those five seats, you're in. So it's amazing to see the kids hustle off the floor just to get into one of those seats to be the next five uh, to be able to go in. And then when they get it, when they get their five set, that's when they really have to communicate. Hey, who's going to be your one? Who's going to be your two? Who's going to be sort of thing. So um, we do have a plan for an entire game, but sometimes you, you scrap it depending on the situation that's going on within the game, I guess. But we usually stick to it pretty, pretty solid until the last three or four minutes. So three years, roster size. Let's talk about roster size a little bit. Um, what's the least amount that you've had on your team or you believe that you can have to run the system? 
We, uh, in, the, in the last three years that we've ran it, I've always had to bring kids up. We don't have enough upperclassmen. Um, we're anywhere from 22 to 27, 28 kids, somewhere in there. So uh, we're always bringing kids up. I'm a big proponent of, I, and, and no matter what style we've been running, I'm never going to give a kid a varsity uniform if I'm not planning on playing them. I don't, to me, it's not fair if I'm bringing a freshman up to give them a uniform just to sit on the end of the bench and watch. You know, if I give you a uniform, I'm telling you, I trust you and I want you to play and you can, and I'm, I'm trying to give you that confidence. So um, realistically for us, uh, we had some injuries in the first year where kids are out for an ankle twist, this or that, or whatever it may be. Um, you need at least, for me, you'd have to have 12 at least to start with, I think. Just so you've got kids backed up in case something happens. You know, you've always got eligibility or you've got injuries or you've got whatever it may be that's going on. Um, I think you got to have those kids that are there to kind of back it up. So I think you're looking at about the 12 mark. Um, if you're not looking to necessarily go full on Grinnell five in five out, if you're looking more at the LMU style, which we've mm -hmm. looked at that a little bit too, I think you can definitely do that with 10 kids um, and maybe even have an 11th, 12th, work up to a 13th kid, but it gets a little bit more difficult in that general area. Um, we're in Illinois, we're only allowed to dress 15 kids, uh, even when it comes to postseason. Um, I guess you could you can dress more during the regular season, but again, to me, that's not you're going to play varsity all year, and then I'm going to tell three kids, okay, give me back your uniform because that's that's crazy to me. But we have had 15. 15 makes it makes it a little bit more difficult to try to get kids in, uh, especially when you get to that stage where after about 12, 13, 14, 15, maybe really really drop off, and that's how do I get more kids in, and how do I work these shifts when my other kids aren't the strongest and um, so I think if you're, if you're having a down year, you might want to look at a shorter number at the varsity level. Um, when you're a little bit better, I think it's easier to split kids up a little bit more. Um, but I would say you need at least, at least 12. Okay. I've heard, I've heard 13 is a really good number for high school. And I agree with you with, I, because of the aspect of high school. And if you're playing traditional and you only play seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 are upset. If system feeds participation and you're supposed to play everybody, and if you carried 16 and you only played 13, 14, 15, and 16 are gonna be upset. So you're, you're in a no-win situation either way. So I, I've heard 13 because you got your top 10, so your AB, and then you got a third string point guard, uh, like a third string utility and like a third string post. So, and then I would, depending on the size of your school, then bring up like your five best, like lower level kids to practice varsity. And then those eight kids do like a control team. And then your top 10 and what you're trying to tell your kids with the competition, like you like to do is you want to be in the top 10. So you get to be the system group. If you're not in the top 10, you're the control group. Right. Um, and then and I can change. You can reward kids, you can demote kids, whatever. But that's what I'm looking at, Coach. I don't know if you like that idea or yeah, like this last my year. Five, my this last year, kids. Was, uh, we had we only had six upperclassmen in this last last group that we had, um, and so I dressed seven of our underclassmen came up. So I had four freshmen and three sophomores that dressed for me. But those kids also played in the JV game. So I've never brought a kid up unless they're going to be playing significant, significant minutes, um, I don't take them away from the JV. Because I've seen that happen a lot of times before, too, where you get this really talented kid that could help you at the varsity level but doesn't quite get the minutes there, and you've taken them away from the JV, and so now they're not playing at all. Um, yeah. So I, I try not to do that. We're running um, the system best we can at the JV level as well. I know I've heard different things on that, whether you should, you shouldn't, whatever. Um, we do it a slightly different where we go about a minute shift uh, for them. Uh, but they're also not, they're still trying to learn what it means to go full, full speed. So um, that minute shift is, is about right for them. But um, you're seeing a lot of success at the JV level. And then those kids carry on that confidence a lot of times to the varsity level with you. Uh, but then the game is a little bit faster for them. So it, it takes a little bit time for them to, to kind of adapt. But there still is that, that competitiveness. Um, one thing that I got this summer from watching your things is, is uh, uh, Kurt Goldsdorf his uh, drill that he picked up there that he runs um, running game. 
that's definitely something. The running, the running drills. Yeah. Yes, that's definitely something we're going to install next year. Um, and I love what he, how he talked about, you know, where every kid's getting in and you're getting a chance to see every kid. Hey, here's our, here's going to be one group this week. Here's a second group. You're on the outside looking in, show me during this drill that you can, you can get in, but we try to do that and make everything competitive as possible in practice. But that seems like it's gonna be a phenomenal drill to be able to incorporate in what we're doing. Um, practice structure real briefly. Um, are you like the traditional coaches where they say they pick a subject each day One, you're installed. So everything's in. So now are you having like certain days of the week or is it harder because we're high school and our schedule isn't as set like colleges? Like, do you have like Monday is your tough day or like, how, how do you break up your practices? Yeah. How long do you go? I tried that the first, after we got past the first couple of weeks, you know, mm -hmm. I, I followed the book to a T, you know, we did offense first week, defense second week. And then, then I tried to follow a little bit of what they're doing. It, it's impossible for me anyway. I mean, it might not be for another high school yeah. coach, but for me, it's impossible when we're playing two to three games a week um, to do some of those different, different things that they did. But um after after the first i would say we go we'll go about two hours the first couple of weeks just to get things in um after our tournament happens which is like we're 10 days in and then we get a, we play five games yeah in six days so yep. after that we drop down to about a, a, an hour 45 um and then after that next week because we have a long we have a, a little bit of a layoff after that so the kids can kind of rest a little bit after that we cut down to about 90 minutes um, of practice. We start at 3.30. We're done at 5 o'clock, um, which is great not only for the kids. It's great for me. I get to spend more time with my family and get to be home for dinner um, and things along those lines. But we spend a half hour every day in some capacity of shooting. Um, so it, And then there'll be different types of drills when it comes to shooting and things like that. We try to record as much as possible. Uh, I get really frustrated when you go to a clinic and people are like, we record every shot that every kid ever, I don't have 19 managers. I don't have 37 <laughs> coaches. Um, yeah, exactly. so we record uh, best we can with drills that we're doing that are, that are specific shooting drills. I don't, we can't chart during 11 man break. I don't chart during, you know, different things like that, but we'll chart if we're taking um, a hundred threes, you know, come, you're coming to let me know after every 25, how many you've made. And I'm just putting that down in a chart or I'm making, making my rounds and I'm asking the kids, you know, what, what are you shooting? Uh, whatever it may be that way, but a half hour every day is, is for shooting. Um, and, and the crazy thing is I've never sat and thought about it. I've never done that much shooting before as a traditional coach, just yeah. straight shooting, 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 you know, I'm, you're trying to be great at many different things and not doing that. But, um, we spend a lot of time on shooting. We'll do a lot of, um, just cycle drills, the three quarter court cycle drills, um, or it might be a full court cycle drill. Uh, but then every day we also work in some type of advantage drill where it's three on two. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean three on two offensive three on two. It might be three defensive versus two offensive type stuff to try to work on, on things like that. But um, I try to throw in as many competitive drills as I can. I hate kids standing around. We practice all together. We don't practice our freshmen don't have a set time and JV they did before I got here. When I got here, I said, you know, we're a team. We're all practicing together. That way we're all on the same page. Um, and if a freshman is out working a senior, I'll switch in practice. That freshman now is going to play here. The senior may go down and play with the JV a little bit just to kind of send a message that no one is above anybody and we're all here to be competitive and uh, whatever it may be. But, and then the last thing I always try to do is I always try to end practice with some type of, upbeat up-tempo fun drill that we can do where it's it's competitive maybe but um you're not always going to leave the gym with a smile on your face i get that mm -hmm. but the last thing i'm going to do before we walk out of a gym is i'm not going to make kid run suicides and then say all right we'll see you later because now you're leaving with a bad taste in your mouth and i have been that guy before you know i've been that guy that that puts everybody on the line and says we're not leaving until every kid makes a free throw and for everyone you miss we got a down and back and now it's a struggle between you and the kids of are you going to let us go or are they actually going to everybody going to make a free throw I have been that guy and I tell you since going to the system um, I've really kind of changed my thought process and, and things along that line even if I were to ever go back to doing traditional there are tons of things that I would take with me from the system um, as just made me a better coach I think and a, and a more of a personable type person that kind of gets the bigger picture now if you will got it do you want to touch on your off-season shooting that you're that you're doing yeah the 
right now we're all we're all on that same boat. In fact, uh, Illinois just came out. Uh, the IHSA has now allowed us, if, if you can wrap your mind around this, we are now allowed to have workouts that are weight training, uh, fitness related, or I can't remember the other part, but they cannot use any type of equipment. You cannot use any type of workout that is sport specific. You cannot like basically saying you can lift weights and you can run, you know, so <laughs> kids are doing that already. But so we put together um, a shooting program from our kids that it basically has about five or six different categories. And really the shooting drills um, come specifically a lot from the dribble drive motion. You know, you're coming from the wing and attacking the other side, uh, catch and shoot type different things. But the kids are just there. I, I put it in an Excel form. I'm not an Excel person. I just kind of played around with it and figured out what's going to be easiest to do it. I finally got it to the point where it calculates everything for me. It took forever, but yeah. I did get it figured out how to do it. But um, basically we use Microsoft office for our school. So I've shared the form with the kids. So they have their own form individually to fill out where they take, um, let's say a hundred shots for the day. They fill out how many they're making at each, uh, particular workout. And then it calculates percentages and all those different things. They have it in there. And then I can go in at any time on my computer and look at that file that I shared with them to see who shot today, who didn't shoot today who's updated theirs, who hasn't updated theirs. And it's just, a, it's been a really good way of holding kids accountable. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I'm trying to do with them just to keep them a little bit more accountable is I'm putting them on weekly teams. So they got a partner. Um, and so they get a point for every shot they take, plus they get a point for every one they make. And then I also give out daily challenges. So like today's daily challenge might be take an extra 100 free throws. And so for anybody that completes the, the daily challenge gets a bonus five points. So then what I do at the end of the week is I'll combine everybody's total points in a group. So if you and I are partners, our total points are combined and then divide it by two. Uh, and then that's our team total for the week. And then we're kind of, kind of competing for the week. Um, so then whoever wins the week gets a bonus point. So if you and I win the week, we each get a 10 point bonus at the end added onto our individual scores. Next week, I have another random group. I do a random picker online. I just go to a, a random name picker to let it pick names so kids can't say that I'm you're biased. You're putting so-and-so together. I do a random picker. Um, and then at the end of the summer, I'm planning on having some type of awards, like a tier type of awards where if you shot so much, you get an award, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you were our overall champion, you're going to get some, you know, a lot of times kids like free gear, you know, yep. so if I get sweatshirts, t-shirts, shorts, whatever it may be, they like a lot of that stuff. Um, we do a lot of reward system within our program as well. Uh, so I'll do things like movie tickets or I'll do things like um, gift certificates to the to the gas station because the kids want gas or whatever it may be. But just little things will motivate those kids quite a bit. So that's what we're trying to do for the summer just to get them motivated to work out on their own a little bit. I think that's a that's a last thing these days. Kids just getting out in the driveway and shooting themselves. Last question I got for you, Coach, is anyone that's interested in running the system or even maybe even – guys that have been running it one or two years, what advice would you give? What you know, last think, advice would you let, leave them with you know, today? I think the, the, biggest device, the biggest advice that I would give is, one, make sure you're doing your research if you haven't, if you're, if you're thinking about doing it, you know, so getting on uh, Zoom calls like this or, or popping into clinics, reading books, things like that. So I think you definitely got to do your homework with it. Um, I think the other big things is have confidence in yourself and what you're doing. If you don't believe in it, uh, or your assistants aren't believing in it and don't get buy-in, the kids aren't going to buy-in. You know, I think they um, know when, when you're not doing something that you don't know or you don't believe in. It's kind of like when you take a timeout at the end of the game and say, okay, we're going to try this, right? Or, you know, we're going to try it. And now kids all of a sudden don't have that confidence in it. So I think you have to be able to have confidence in yourself to be able to step outside the box to do it a little bit. Um, I also would at least make sure those lines of communication are open between you and your administration. And, and it, everybody's situation is different. It, it's completely different. I know that some are supportive, some aren't supportive. Some people don't care, whatever it may be, but at least let them know, hey, this is, this is what I'm thinking about doing type thing. And I just wanted to give you a heads up because it might cause some concerns or it might raise a few eyebrows or, or whatever it may be. But um, I definitely think it, it's your homework as far as doing the research and then just having confidence in yourself. And the last thing would just be, I think, to network. You know, I think the, the big thing is like we've been having these system clinics that you're putting on when you can sit with a, a group of people that that understand your language and know what it means 
yeah. when you're talking about different things. And for me, the big thing has been, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I don't know if there's a right way or wrong way or whatever, but when I hear coach Barber talk or I hear coach Porter talk, or um, when you had uh, coach Arsenal on and they're like, we do this, this, and this, I'm thinking, all right, well, at least I know I'm doing some things that we're supposed to be doing or uh, how it should be done. And it, it just gives you some confidence in yourself. But I think surrounding yourself with, with like-minded people um, yeah. is a plus as well. I think we've developed, I think with the group and then the positive thing, that's all that's going on is I think we have, we've developed our own little support group. So, so we can all like lean on each other throughout the season and check in with each other and, and bounce the ideas. Um, especially like you being, I don't know if it's, you're considered a veteran one, but it's, it's weird. Most people that try it don't last doing it three years or even four years. It's they, they try it, they do it one or two years and then eh, they couldn't handle the parental or the poor kids or, or whatever, the, whatever the case may be why they chose to, to shut it down. There's not isn't too many high schools running it for five, six, seven years. It's absolutely. I think, and I think a lot of that is is confidence in what you're doing. Um, I do think there's adjustments that can be made every year. You know, maybe maybe you're not subbing in five in five out, but you're still doing some of the same things, or maybe uh, you're running a little bit different offense to flow with it, or maybe your defensive philosophy changed a little bit. But I also think it's a whole lot different ball game coaching it at the college level when you can recruit different kids in to right. come do it. Versus here's the kids that are walking in the door to do it. And that's what makes it a little bit more tough. Uh, especially at the college level, you don't have to listen to the parents as much, you know, at high school level it's, it's, you're not so, uh, I don't want to use the word protected, but parents will voice their opinions quite a bit more at the high school level. It seems like. Yeah. Well, when only 1% of schools are probably running this, it's, it's one of those, but I, I wanted to thank you for coming on um, and all that you've contributed and helped with the group. And I just see that the group's getting bigger, is not necessarily getting bigger, but it's getting better and tighter and moving towards bigger and better things with it. And just appreciated you coming on and let me ask you some questions and, and talk a little bit about system basketball this afternoon. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been a great opportunity. And this, the whole thing that you put together has been phenomenal just for networking purposes to get together. So hop on the, Hop on your, your website, the systembasketball.com is great. Uh, you got your YouTube channel up and running, which yeah. is absolutely phenomenal to check out. There's so many resources out there. And, and the one thing I know somebody's mentioned this before, but system coaches are the most willing to share any and everything. There's no secrets. They're not going to hide anything. They're going to, in fact, a lot of times they might be over truthful for what you want to hear, but um, it's been great. So I, I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Well, system basketball clinics are usually uh wednesdays and saturdays but we'll probably be making a switch here to maybe one night a week because things are starting to open up and people want to get outside so but look forward to new things and everything you can check everything out at systembasketball.com again coach keen from macomb macomb and phenomenal coach and thank you again coach thank you